for uh, allowing me the time to talk to you. I really appreciate it. I know I've done this um, a few times, maybe a few years ago, so I apologize to any of you if it's a duplication or a review of what you already know, but um, I think just getting some basics for oncology and um, what you may see in the hospital is important for everybody, even if oncology is not going to be your specialty. So feel free to interrupt me at any point during this. Um, obviously, this presentation is for you. It's not for me. So I'm happy to answer any questions at any point. Um, also, my contacts info is on here. So if you guys have questions during rotations or anything like that, and uh, you want to contact me with any questions, I'm always happy to assist in any way that I can. <clears throat> so today, I thought we would start with um, tumor lysis syndrome, and then move into some oncologic emergencies. Uh, we'll discuss hypercalcemia of malignancy, as well as spin spinal cord compression and SVC syndrome. Uh, uh, then we'll spend a few minutes talking about chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, um, kind of looking at refractory nausea and vomiting and what can be done in the hospital setting. And then because immunotherapy has been such a hot topic over the last few years, I just wanted to do a quick immunotherapy review in cancer and then uh, make a few points about um, what should be done for our patients in the hospital that are admitted um, and patients that are on immunotherapy. So starting out with tumor lysis syndrome, what actually is it? Um, in cancer patients, we have rapid destruction of malignant cells once we start chemotherapy, and that releases all the intracellular contents into the circulation system, especially um, all of your electrolytes. So this is most commonly seen after the administration of chemotherapy, um, typically within the first two days afterwards. In some patients, we can see um, spontaneous tumor lysis. Um, that's pretty rare, except for in the cases of um, CLL patients that have exceptionally high white blood cell counts. Some of the most common complications that we see are hyperkalemia, hyperuricemia, and then hyperphosphatemia, which can result in hypocalcemia. Um, and all of that can lead to renal failure in patients. So what are the risk factors that we need to watch for in patients that are starting on chemotherapy? Um, first, we want to be aware of any patient that has a really high tumor burden. So those patients that have white, high white counts or high peripheral blasts in their uh, circulation system. We also are worried about patients that have a tumor that has a high tumor proliferative rate or those cancers that are exceptionally chemosensitive. So thinking about um, like our small cell cancer patients. Um, your increased risk with the amount of extent of disease that you have, and then if you already have pre-existing renal dysfunction or volume depletion, your risk is also greater. <clears throat> so some of the cancers we definitely want to watch for, any high-grade lymphoma, so especially if you have a patient um, that's admitted with Burkitt's or lymphoblastic lymphoma, if they're starting on treatment, you would want to um, prophylactically treat them for tumor lysis syndrome. We do see it in ALL and AML, um, but those are typically only if patients have a high white blood cell count. And then moderate risk for TLS um, are those patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it's really those patients that have bulky disease. Like I mentioned earlier, um, patients with CLL and really high white counts or in CML blast crisis can also be at risk. Lower risk are going to be all your solid tumors. Um, I have seen it in small cell lung cancer pretty rarely. And then um, I've seen a few cases of prostate cancer with tumor lysis syndrome, but it's really going to be your leukemias and lymphomas that we need to um, at least start prophylaxis in. There's a little bit of a difference between clinical tumor lysis and actual laboratory tumor lysis. So laboratory is going to be much more common and it's um, within three days before and seven days after the initiation of chemo. And that's just going to be any laboratory changes that you see that are, are pretty expected. We don't really worry until a patient is until, into clinical tumor lysis syndrome, and that's laboratory tumor lysis plus um, a change in creatinine usually. It would also be if your patient is in some sort of cardiac arrhythmias due to the electrolyte changes or if a patient has seizure. Unfortunately, acute renal failure is pretty common in patients that have tumor lysis, and that happens due to the hyperuricemia that we see. 
um, due to the uric acid, uric acid crystal formulation in the renal tubules. So when you have all of these cells releasing their nucleic acid, you're gonna have a buildup of uric acid in, in the renal tubules. We can also see hyperphosphatemia. And in that case, we're gonna see this calcium phosphate crystals um, deposit in the renal tubules as well. And that can lead to renal failure. That's kind of combined with our drug associated nephrotoxicity that we're seeing with the chemotherapy. So it's kind of a double whammy. You start patients on a nephrotoxic chemotherapy drug and then you get tumor lysis on top of that. So you're kind of hitting their kidneys in two different ways um, leading to that acute renal failure. <clears throat> so how are we gonna manage TLS? Um, first, we need to identify any at-risk patients. Then we're gonna start prevention and um, in patients that aren't treated adequately, um, we will need to do some aggressive acute therapy. So for TLS prevention, we want to discontinue any contributing medications. So if patients are on high dose supplements like potassium supplements, we would want to start that prior to initiation of chemotherapy. Uh, we also want to correct any pre-existing electrolyte imbalances. And then the mainstay of treatment is going to be hydration. So we will usually start patients at at least, you know, 200 to 250 mils an hour um, prior to initiation of chemotherapy. And usually we'll need some sort of diuretic as well to kind of help diurese those patients. Um, typically Lasix, 20 to 40 milligrams a day will be adequate uh, for those patients. Also important in prevention to start allopurinol. We usually do a 600 milligram loading dose and that can be oral. Um, and then that's followed by 300 milligrams daily, at least one to two days prior to starting chemo. You'll want to continue for three to seven days following the completion of chemotherapy until all of that's really gotten through, through their system. Um, I'll tell you on the outpatient basis, we typically keep patients on allopurinol for 14 to 30 days actually after treatment um, <clears throat> just to prevent any continuing TLS that, that can occur. As far as um, your electrolyte abnormalities go, you're going to treat them just as you would any, any other patient. So for patients that have hyperkalemia, um, caxalate is a good option, and then calcium if you're having any elect, um, EKG abnormalities. If that's not working, you can use your insulin and sodium bicarb, um, and we already have patients on aggressive diuresis at this point usually. For hyperphosphatemia, you can use your phosphate binders, <clears throat> and then hypocalcemia, as long as patients are asymptomatic, we typically won't treat them. Um, as far as treatment and prevention of hyperuricemia, we've already started our patients on allopurinol, so that's going to help prevent the um, formulation of uric acid that can deposit in the kidneys. So you can see on the right-hand side, um, you have the purine catabolism, and what allopurinol does is it um, actually inhibits xanthine oxidase. So you're going to stop um, uric acid formation by blocking uh, the transition of hypoxanthine and xanthine into uric acid. Unfortunately, a lot of times uh, allopurinol is started too late in patients and we already have the formulation of uric acid. So how we can get rid of the uric acid that's already been formed is to give patients rasburicase. And um, that's basically urate oxidase, and that can help break down the pre-existing uric acid that's already there. And it turns into a soluble form of allantoin. Um, something that's really important that I get questioned a lot in the hospital is um, blood samples after patients get rasburicase. So it's very important that it, for retesting for uric acid levels after patients get rasburicase, that the uric acid levels have to be collected in pre-chilled tubes and they have to be placed in ice baths um, immediately following. They need to be assayed within four hours after that. Um, I know that it's not something that's typically done, so I'll usually have to call up the nurses and remind them um, of, of actually how to collect those. If you don't do that, the rasburicase is going to continue to work in the blood after it's collected and you're going to get falsely low uric acid levels um, on your test. Because rasburicase is exceptionally expensive, we do have restrictions um, on a system level. 
So you'll see if you're putting in a power plant for Raspberry case that patients have to have an oncology diagnosis and they have to have some pre-existing renal dysfunction. Um, they also have to <clears throat> have started IV hydration and allopurinol um, prior to Raspberry case use. And then we're going to dose Raspberry case based on the patient's initial uric acid level. So for patients um, with a level less than 12, we actually won't start Raspberry case and they recommend rechecking it in 24 hours. Um, for anybody with a level between 12 and 15, we're gonna give a solid three milligram dose. And anyone over 15, um, we will allow six milligrams. They've seen in recent studies that dosing it based on weight is not more helpful than just giving a standard three or six milligram dose. So if you look in LexiComp, you're not going to see this anywhere, um, but all the recent literature has, has shown that these are adequate. <clears throat> so after that, you're gonna get another uric acid level within 24 hours. And then based on that number, we may or may not redose raspberry case at that point. I'll tell you in my experience, um, a three milligram dose pretty much takes care of it for any patient. Um, if you have a level between 12 and 15, it'll probably go down to eight within 24 hours. So as long as you're continuing hydration, uh, we typically don't have to redose those patients unless they're like a Burkitt's patients that, that's continuing to lice um, post-treatment. So I'll go ahead and move on to oncologic emergencies. And the first one I wanted to talk about was hypercalcemia of malignancy. It's something that we see pretty commonly um, on the inpatient side, even in patients that, that were kind of just randomly checking calcium in and, and our newly diagnosed patients. So it, there are a few different mechanisms that can cause hypercalcemia of malignancy in our patients. And we see parathyroid hormone related peptide produced by the tumors. Um, this is most often in patients that have a squamous histology for their cancer. So that's going to be our lung, esophageal, head and neck, and cervical patients. Um, sometimes we will see parathyroid hormone over secretion, and then pretty rarely we'll see a direct osteolytic effect of the tumor on the bone. Um, that's typically in your multiple myeloma patients, or if you have patient with extensive bone mets, so say a prostate or a breast cancer patient, um, I have seen hypercalcemia in them due to those um, bone metastases as well. As far as how patients are presenting, it's usually pretty vague and nonspecific, um, and it's not the exact calcium level that patients have, it's really the change in their calcium level and how, how quickly it's changed. So patients may be complaining of constipation, um, but most often they're going to be lethargic and have some sort of um, mental status changes. So in anybody that presents with, you know, extensive bone mets or <clears throat> extensive um, liver mets or something like that, I would check calcium levels just to make sure that they're not having hypercalcemia. Uh, definitely want to get EKG on those patients as well and then monitor them for any renal failure um, as those hyper um, calcemic patients can have crystal formulation as well. So again, kind of like with TLS, hydration is going to be our mainstay of treatment. So starting patients um, at 100 to 150 for someone that's really extensive, even going up to 200 mils an hour of, of uh, just normal saline is fine. And then diuretics are also important. Um, Lasix is going to be the mainstay diuretic that I would use because it's actually going to help excrete the calcium. You obviously wouldn't want to use a thiazide because it will um, actually retain calcium in your in your body. So making sure that, sure that you're using a loop diuretic. Um, for patients that are symptomatic or are having EKG changes, calcitonin is recommended, um, but that's really only short-term control because after 24 to 48 hours, you can get tachyphylaxis with, with calcitonin. So it's a good... Um, Good measure to quickly get calcium down in patients that are that are symptomatic. And then one of your other mainstays of treatment is going to be a bisphosphonate. So our drug of choice is going to be zolandronic acid for these patients. And you will want to start them at a four milligram dose 
Um, even if patients present with some sort of renal dysfunction, you're going to do a set four milligram zolindronic acid for them. Um, this is not going to work overnight. It typically takes between two and five days, really, for the onset of a bisphosphonate. So you have your fluids to start with. You're going to give patients calcitonin if they are symptomatic and then starting with Zometa as well. You're going to always want to recheck your calcium on a daily basis. And then if patients are still having hypercalcemia at five to seven days, at that point, you could redose again with um, a bisphosphonate. So bisphosphonates are working to inhibit that bone resorption by the osteoclast. So that's why it's going to take them a few days to actually start working. That's not going to be an immediate change in calcium because it's working on the osteoclast um, resorption. If the um, zolindronic acid by itself will usually lower calcium by two to three milligrams per deciliter. And again, it's a delayed effect, um, not seen until at least you know, two to five days after treatment. Uh, the next oncologic emergency I wanted to talk about was spinal cord compression. And this is a neurologic complication that we see in some patients um, with metastatic disease to the spine. And what you'll see is an erosion of that epidural space by the tumor. Um, it's not exceptionally common, only about 2,500 patients, or 25,000 patients a year, excuse me. And it's most commonly seen in patients that have uh, solid tumors that metastasize to bone most often. So that's gonna be our breast cancer, prostate cancer, and non-small non cell lung cancer patients. Um, spinal cord compression most commonly involves the thoracic spine and patients typically present with back pain. Um, it's not usually immediate. It's something that progresses over days to months and you'll just hear them tell you that they have a back pain and it's been getting worse. Um, it can also present with motor weakness or some sort of sensory impairment. And then we've often had patients call and tell us about urinary hesitancy or retention. And in those patients, um, we would wanna evaluate them for spinal cord compression as well. So as far as diagnosis goes, the gold standard for evaluation is gonna be an MRI of the spine and our goal is to relieve pain and um, improve their neurologic function. First line treatment for these patients is going to be steroids. So we'll start dexamethasone um, between four and six milligrams every four to six hours. So I've seen six Q6, I've also seen four Q4. So it really doesn't matter um, as long as we're starting steroids pretty quickly in these patients to, um, to relieve that inflammation. We also want to send an immediate surgery consult. Um, and then we also want to consult RADONC to see if radiation would be of benefit in those patients as well to help shrink the, the tumor quickly. Uh, the next topic I want to talk about was superior vena cava syndrome. <clears throat> and this is about 15,000 patients per year. And this is really when we see solid tumors that are resulting in compression or obstruction of the, of the vena cava. The tumors that we see most commonly cause this are non-small cell lung cancers. Um, it also happens in small cell. And then those diffuse large B cell lymphomas where patients have really big um, mediastinal lymph nodes that can be the pressing on the superior vena cava. Uh, we also can see this in patients that have ports um, due to a thrombus in their indwelling catheters as well. Again, this is something that's more progressive, usually happens over days to weeks, and you'll see um, patients that have quite a bit of swelling in their um, upper body, so usually it presents in their face or in their arms, and it's usually quite striking and you're worried and you want to do something really quickly, but the swelling itself is usually um, not not that significant. It's more significant if you have patients that have um, laryngeal edema or they have narrowing of their respiratory tract. So if patients present with dyspnea or strider or something like that, we want to definitely make sure that we're doing something quickly for those patients. And it can also evolve in, into cerebral, cerebral edema. <clears throat> 
So how you're gonna diagnose this, uh, you wanna get a CT of the chest with contrast and our goal is to remove that compression. So you would wanna place a consult to see if a stent placement would be uh, possible. And then the real treatment is gonna be treating the underlying cause of malignancy. So starting chemotherapy right away in patients that have like a small cell lung cancer or a diffuse large B cell, seeing if we can do inpatient chemotherapy for them. And then doing a radonc consult as well to see if um, radiation can do emergency um, treatment for those patients to help shrink that, um, that obstruction. Obviously, it's, if it's caused by thrombosis, you're going to remove uh, whatever catheter and then anticoagulate your patient. Supportive care for SVC syndrome, again, a lot of inflama underlying inflammation. So you can start patients on dexamethasone. Um, if patients have dyspnea, obviously start oxygen. And then diuretics usually help us feel better to help um, with some of that swelling. But until you really relieve that compression, um, they're not really of much value. All right, kind of switching gears and talking about chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, it's something that I talk quite a bit about with our patients. Um, so there are multiple different types of nausea and vomiting that we see in chemotherapy. Um, there's acute, chemo or acute nausea and vomiting that happens within 24 hours of treatment. Delayed nausea is within 24 hours after treatment, um, out until about a week after treatment. We see quite a bit of anticipatory nausea in patients that have had um, bad experiences in the past. So before their next chemo treatment, they'll come in um, nauseous before they even start. And then breakthrough nausea and vomiting is something that I think is the hardest to treat. Um, and it's those patients that are gonna require rescue meds at home. Um, kind of goes hand in hand with refractory and that is patients who have failed prophylaxis in an earlier cycle of chemotherapy. So the MCCN guidelines classify chemotherapy based on how emetogenic um, the chemotherapy is. So we have minimal, low, moderate, and high. And they define minimal as a chemotherapy agent that is causing nausea or vomiting in less than 10% of patients. They then classify high as a chemotherapy agent that's going to cause um, acute MSS in greater than 90% of patients. So um, it, these are all classified based on the clinical trial that led to the approval of the agent and based on what um, classification they're in, that is how we will determine what prophylaxis we want to give patients. So for someone with minimal um, risk, they're actually not required to have any sort of nausea and vomiting prophy, but they should have something at home in order to treat it if it happens. So sending uh, a Zofran or a composine script home with patients um, for breakthrough nausea would be beneficial in those patients. For patients with a low classification, they should have one drug on board. So starting either um, a steroid like dexamethasone or a 5-HT3 inhibitor would be appropriate for them. Anyone with moderate would require a two-drug treatment regimen. So they would need a steroid plus a 5-HT3 inhibitor. And then anyone in the high classification system is going to require a three or four drug regimen. And that will um, consist of a steroid, a 5-HT3 inhibitor, an NK1 antagonist, um, plus or minus olanzapine. So just some clinical pearls. Uh, obviously, antiemetics should be initiated prior to chemotherapy, um, usually at least 15 to 30 minutes prior to starting. And they should be continued for the duration of time that the chemotherapy is going to be emetogenic. And by that, I mean, if you have a patient that is getting a drug that has um, a three-day half-life, we wanna make sure that we have drugs on board for that entire three to five days after chemotherapy. Um, or if you have a patient that's on a five-day regimen, you wanna make sure that you're giving them something every single day that they're getting treatment. 
We do know that um, oral and IV 5-HT3 antagonists have equivalent efficacy. So I always have people ask me if the patients on oral Zofran, if switching it to IV is going to be a more effective. And um, the answer is no. So all studies have shown that they are equivalent. But if a patient's having trouble keeping down their 5-HT3, so they swallow the Zofran and vomit it right back up, obviously IV or the ODT formulation is going to be a better option for them. Um, another see, thing that I see a lot is for patients that are getting aloxy or palinocitron. Um, it has a 72 hour duration of action. So oftentimes people will give aloxy and then they'll give Zofran for home use for any breakthrough nausea. And that's not helpful because you still have aloxy on those receptors. And so giving Zofran is not gonna have any additional benefit. So you really need to use um, an agent with a different mechanism of action in those patients. So um, I mentioned the NK1 antagonist. We have two different um, formulations of that approved. So you can either use a prepotent or fosaprepotent, which is the IV version that we typically give. Um, these are approved for high and moderately emetogenic chemotherapy. And they have a complementary mechanism with the other antiemetics. So they work exceptionally well when you're given with corticosteroids and a 5-HT3 antagonist. Um, they also have a 72 to 96 hour duration of action. So giving them for patients that have delayed nausea um, is very helpful. What I get asked most though are in patients that have had appropriate prophylaxis and then they're having breakthrough nausea. So you've given them everything that you can think of. So what do you do when they're having breakthrough? Um, a lot of patients will tell me that they are dizzy and that's causing their nausea. So sometimes even doing something as simple as adding a scopolamine patch on them um, <clears throat> can be very beneficial, especially if they have a really long car drive to and from chemotherapy. Um, sometimes the motion sickness in combination with the chemotherapy nausea um, can be what's kind of pushing it over the edge. So adding a scopolamine patch for them can be helpful. Um, we can also use benzodiazepines in those patients that are having anticipatory nausea. Um, they don't have actual anti-nausea properties, but uh, for those really anxious patients that are kind of making themselves nauseous, um, benzos are, are a fantastic option. Um, we also have dronabinol as an option, um, Reglan in patients that are having motility issues is, um, is a good breakthrough option, and then comp Bazine and Phenergan are kind of our go-tos. In the last, I'd say, three to five years, olanzapine has really been um, all the rage for breakthrough nausea and vomiting or delayed nausea and vomiting, um, especially because we have the ODT formulation of it. If patients are having breakthrough while they're getting chemotherapy, um, this is typically the first, first agent that I'll go to um, because it seems to work quickly and um, with a different mechanism of action than all of the other agents that we've tried. Um, I think I already mentioned that for lorazepam. Sometimes our patients um, that are getting chemotherapy have a lot of heartburn and they have a hard time differentiating between what is heartburn and what is nausea. So trying a PPI or an H2 blocker in, in patients um, that are having refractory nausea is, is also something that you can try. Um, just some other breakthrough therapy principles. I found that routine, routine around the clock administration of antiemetics is sometimes more beneficial than PRN. Um, patients are hesitant to take as needed nausea medicines, but if you really instruct them that they need to take something, you know, every eight hours for the first three to five days after chemotherapy, they'll do that, but they won't take it just as needed. So um, kind of having those discussions with your patients and kind of seeing where they are with things um, is important. Always trying different drugs uh, with different mechanisms of action is helpful in patients that have refractory or breakthrough nausea. And there's really no treatment that's been proven better than others. Um, so usually I will go to what's the cheapest first um, and what's gonna cause the, le 
uh, least amount of side effects for patients. In those patients that do have breakthrough, you want to think about their next chemotherapy um, cycle and adding additional prophylaxis in their next cycle. So say you have a patient who had um, moderate emetogenic risk and you gave them Zofran and dexamethasone and they had breakthrough nausea. Next time I would probably either add olanzapine or amend to their regimen to help prevent that nausea um, for, their, for their next treatment and seeing how that works. <clears throat> so um, finally to end, I wanted to talk about immunotherapy just because it's basically being added to chemotherapy in almost every one of our disease states right now. So I'm not going to give you guys an immuno immunology review, um, but just remembering that immunotherapy is working on the adaptive immunity, and it's really that T cell response um, that we're, we're working to, um, to affect with our immunotherapy treatments. So we know that um, in cancer, you have your tumors that are secreting this tumor antigen. Um, you have the dendritic cell that then takes up that antigen, and in the lymph nodes, it's going to present that to the resting T cell. Once that T cell is activated, it should then go back to the tumor, recognize that antigen, and be able to um, then kill the tumor at the site. So that would be our normal cancer immunology cycle that's working. What we have found is that tumors are expressing PDL1 which is basically turning off those T cells. Um, they're like the brakes for the immune system. So this actual engagement doesn't happen and the tumor is able to survive. So we found that by giving that PDL1 inhibitor, it breaks that connection that's the brakes and allows the tumor to then continue, or the T cells to then continue to recognize that tumor and eradicate the tumor. So our T cells have, um, activating signals and inhibitory signals. We know that uh, working on the PDL1 or PD1 inhibitors are, um, are a good option. We also now have drugs for CTLA4, and CTLA4 activation actually happens more in the lymph nodes, whereas PD1 and PDL1 is more at the site of the tumor. Um, so sometimes using a PD1 and CTLA4 inhibitor in conjunction. So for an example, um, using ipilimumab and avolumab in combination really works to turn the um, tumor response back on in patients. We've seen response in almost all different tumor types. Um, I'd say across the board, if you have to ask me what the response rate is to immunotherapy as a single agent, it's about 20% for um, pretty much all solid tumors. Uh, but we do see some tumors that are um, especially affected by immunotherapy, and those are going to be your melanomas, uh, your MSS, MSI high colorectal cancers, and then your classic Hodgkin, Hodgkin's lymphoma. We see um, very, very high response rates in those tumors specifically, um, and it's those tumors that have required multiple mutations that causes them to look so much different than self, um, so that once that T cell is activated, it can really recognize those malignancies more easily. Um, something else that's always important to remember is with immunotherapy, we see a pseudo, pseudo progression in some patients. Um, so you can see in this patient, after starting treatment at week eight, it actually looks much worse than it did at week one uh, when started. And then once you get to week 12, you start to see that, see that uh, response. And that's due to the inflammatory nature of starting immunotherapy. So you're gonna see that T cell inflammation um, a few weeks in, and that's actually a good thing um, to show that it's working. And then you can see with continued use, how that actually kind of melts away. And again, um, seeing a PD-1 inhibitor in nivolumab in non-small cell lung cancer, you can see that prior to treatment, the nodule um, is this size, but then after you know eight weeks of treatment, it actually looks larger. So making sure in patients that we're not scanning too early and just catching that pseudo progression, but actually waiting, you know, the three to four months after treatment started, 
to um, see the full effect of immunotherapy. As far as side effects go, it's not like our traditional chemotherapy when we're going to see side effects within the first, you know, two days, two weeks. It's really going to be delayed side effects with immunotherapy. Um, it usually starts with rash around four weeks and then diarrhea starting about five to seven weeks after treatment. Things that we see a little bit later are going to be our endocrinopathies. So our hypophysitis um, or hypothyroidism um, can come months after treatment has started and they can really happen at any time. Oops, sorry. So we know that with our immune related side effects, you can get inflammation virtually anywhere in the body. So things that are most typical that I tell patients to report um, would be any sort of dermatitis or rash, um, as well as changes in bowel habits, um, and then any changes in pulmonary function as well. Things that we're gonna be monitoring on our side are definitely um, kidney and renal dysfunction, as well as monitoring thyroid function on um, a pretty routine basis. E before each treatment, we will we'll be checking each of those labs. When all of these drugs first came out, they were being dosed um, at least every two to three weeks. But now, as we've gotten used to them and drug companies are coming out with um, set doses, we're dosing patients every four to six weeks now, depending on, on which agent is used. So we're seeing these patients less and less often. So it's really important to educate patients about the side effects to watch for and when they need to be calling in uh, to let us know about them. So going through some of the um, management of these immune toxicities, really it's all gonna be based on the grade that patients have, and all of this is within the NCCN guidelines. Um, there's also guidelines from SITSI, which is an immunotherapy um, collaboration, and there are guidelines from ASCO as well. So our office typically uses the NCCN guidelines to grade and manage um, our patients. So first thing you're gonna do is grade them. Um, for colitis, you're gonna assess the number of stools per day above the, what their baseline is. And then once you've graded them, it'll give you a pretty straightforward management um, guidelines. So <clears throat> whether it's just giving antidiarrheals, holding treatment, or initiating steroids. Um, for patients that need steroids from Immunotherapy toxicity will typically start anywhere between one to two mg per kg per day. Um, and depending on the severity, it's going to be either inpatient or outpatient. And then we're going to taper those slowly over three to four weeks. Uh, we see that if we taper them faster than that, we often get um, a rebound toxicity. For patients that don't respond to steroids, um, for colitis, we found that infliximab is a really good agent to help um, with co uh, immunotherapy-induced colitis in these patients. Um, for hepatitis, again, we're going to do the same thing. Obviously, we're going to grade it first, and then based on the grade, um, we will decide if holding treatment is enough and then rechecking in a few weeks. And then if um, corticosteroids are needed, we will start those. In patients that are steroid refractory, we found that Celsept is a good agent um, to use as a second line option uh, to help help rebound those um, LFTs in our patients. For dermatitis, this is one of the most common toxicities that, that we'll see um, and patients will complain about. For them, it's just really important to, to do normal skincare, so making sure that they have moisturized, that they're wearing sunscreen and avoiding the sun. Um, sometimes just as easy as starting an antihistamine in these patients will work, um, but for more severe cases, starting topical corticosteroids or in severe cases, starting oral or IV steroids um, at a high dose and then tapering them over a few weeks is necessary. And then for endocrinopathies, these can be serious and fatal if they're not managed. So we've seen some severe cases of hypo hypophysitis in our patients um, that have started on CTLA-4 inhibitors in 
combination with PD-1 inhibitors. So if a patient presents and they have really nonspecific um, symptoms, so they have severe headache or fatigue or changes in mental status, it's really important to um, do a full workup of them and make sure that they're not having that primary adrenal insufficiency and starting them on high-dose steroids right away. They need to be managed by an endo, um, endocrinologist as well, just because they will take a lot more management um, for a chronic period of time. As far as um, just treating thyroid dysfunction, it's one of the only toxicities that we don't hold treatment for. Typically, we'll just start them on Synthroid and then monitor them each month and adjust doses as, ne as necessary. And then for pneumonitis, it's kind of more nonspecific and can be really hard to diagnose, especially since a lot of our patients have underlying COPD or they have lung cancer. Um, so making sure that we're following those patients that have increased oxygen requirements or um, with dyspnea and kind of determining whether they have a pneumonia versus a pneumonitis um, can be challenging but something that we definitely need to be watching for in our, our patients. So when can we restart patients on immunotherapy um, after they've had one of these immune-related toxicity? So if it's not as um, high of a grade, so a grade one or grade two, we usually just wait until the side effect resolves. If they are more severe and required high-dose steroids, we do need to wait until their steroid dose has reduced to at least 10 milligrams per day or less of a prednisone equivalent. And then for endocrinopathies, again, um, even grade four, we're not gonna require the termination of immunotherapy. We're just gonna treat the endocrinopathy on a chronic basis. So that is all I had planned for you guys today, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments or anything you guys are curious about.